can't figure out when. <clears throat> I like that. Get her over here. I'm on a lunch hour at some point. Oh, okay. My yeah, screen has changed. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm great. Well, who was that? Craig in Maryland. Oh, yeah. All good. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm excited about doing this. I want to do it more often. <laughs> Gotta Mike, make feel free to get us started here whenever you'd like here. Oh, anytime? Yep, go ahead. Welcome to the first ever Shocker Volleyball Virtual Fan Fest presented by Cox. I'm your host, Mike Kennedy, and we would like to thank you for taking the opportunity to join us tonight and get the opportunity to get to know this 2021 Shocker Volleyball team a little bit, preview the upcoming season. And for those of you who may be planning your evening around how long this is going to take and so forth, we plan for it to be about an hour. Some of the players have joined us. You'll get a chance to know them a little better. You'll hear from head coach Chris Lamb, who will reveal the 2021 schedule. And we'll hear how the team has kind of navigated these unusual and difficult circumstances over the past few months. We'll take a look into what the team is doing now. And uh, coaches and players will answer some pre-submitted questions from you, the fans. So at the end of the call, we'll draw a winner for our grand prize giveaway featuring lots of apparel, a team signed volleyball, and some additional accessories. And speaking of prizes, being sent now in the Zoom chat are some digital door prizes that you will all have access to download throughout the duration of this Zoom call, simply for being here tonight. Wow. So again, we thank you for taking the opportunity to join <laughs> us. We encourage you to check out the digital prizes that will be sent in the link in the Zoom chat now. And before we get started tonight, we thought it would be a good idea just to go over a few ground rules. We ask that you maintain proper Zoom etiquette and respect the others that are on the call. We ask that you keep your microphones muted at all times and engage in appropriate behavior while your cameras are on. <laughs> it's obviously not required for you to have your camera on. That decision's up to you. But again, your mic should remain muted throughout the call. However, any profanity, racial or ethnic <laughs> comments, or other intimidating actions directed at anyone on the call will not be tolerated and are grounds for removal from the call. I don't think that's probably necessary for any of you, but we just had to set the ground rules, so let's have respect for ourselves and everyone else here tonight. With all of that having been said, let's introduce the members of the team that are here with us tonight, starting with, of course, head coach Chris Lamb and a few players from the team who are going to introduce themselves. They'll do it by numerical order of their jerseys. And we'll start with Briley Kelly. So Briley, get us going. Okay, hi, I'm Briley. I am from Frankfurt, Illinois. Uh, I'm number three on the team. Um, I am athletically a redshirt sophomore and academically I am a junior and I'm an outside hitter. Very well. Yeah. Hi, my hey. name is Casey Litzow. I'm from Greenville, Wisconsin. I'm number five. I'm a sophomore and I'm a setter as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Sina Uluwave. I am from Laie, Hawaii. My jersey number is number 10. I am a sophomore and right now I am training as for position, I'm training libero. Hi, I'm Laura McMahon. Um, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm number 12. Um, I am a freshman and I'm a middle blocker. Hi guys, uh, I'm Michaela Wench. I'm from Algonquin, Illinois. I am number 14. I'm a senior and I'm the one of the other setters on the team. Hi, I'm Mariah Buss. I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm number 16. I'm a freshman and an outside hitter. Hi, I'm Sophia Rowling. I'm from Thayer, Kansas. I'm number 20. I am a sophomore and I'm an opposite. Hi, I'm Morgan Weber. Uh, my hometown is Dyke, Iowa. I'm number 22 and I'm a freshman and I'm an outside hitter. All right. Thank you, ladies. And we especially appreciate you all being on the call tonight. 
At this time, let's talk with Lambeau about the teams that we can expect to see on the schedule this upcoming season. And Chris, what are your thoughts on the schedule as, how, as far as how it's looking like and, and certainly uh, an unusual schedule and start to the season and all of those kinds of things? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, so it's been about, it's kind of been the Wild West. Um, people are just scrambling and uh, there's a, pretty much everybody's got travel restrictions. Not sure how many non-conference plane flights you would even see throughout the country. We don't have a lot of schools nearby. So uh, it, it's, you know, driving and they don't even want us to stay overnight. So non-conference matches are in and out. Um, we were able to get some matches before our conference starts. So I'll sort of go in numerical order or follow the calendar. Um, right off the bat, Missouri State called and said that they would be able to play non-con. They were the first person within driving distance to call me. And I was excited about that. Uh, he informed me right away that he couldn't travel. So I said, well, I think we can. So can we get some teams up there? My hope was that we could do that. Um, and my hope is that they will return because we were talking about that anyways for next year and the year after, next fall and the fall after. So I have a feeling we will get a home and home out of Missouri State. But soon after uh, I committed to Missouri State, Oral Roberts committed to Missouri State, and St. Louis said they would come too. St. Louis was wavering on their protocol with um, COVID-19. Maybe we'll get to that later. Uh, but I told him that I knew South Dakota, who was very good, 20 or 31 and three last year, and a couple of nice players, uh, was interested in playing us and Creighton. I couldn't get Creighton to get their times lined up, not because of Creighton, more because of the Big East, but we were able to get them to Missouri State. So next weekend, we'll open with um, uh, South Dakota, then we'll play Oral Roberts, and then we'll play Missouri State. That's next weekend. The following weekend, we have our return match here with North Texas. You might remember we played them at their place two seasons ago last year at Cal Poly, uh, and then this year, the final year of that three-way deal, they're coming here. Cal Poly would have two, but of course, no no travel or no flights for non-con. So what we're going to have is two nights uh, with North Texas, seven o'clock on Friday, six o'clock on Saturday. The week after that is open, but I could not find uh, anybody within driving distance that I could play on that weekend. So we have a week off from playing. Then the week after that is conference. Within our conference schedule, which is only the teams in the Western half, we have a couple of bye weeks. And inside the bye weeks, we have a home and home with K-State. I can't tell you exactly the dates because they changed it two days ago because of a women's basketball conflict in the Big 12, and now they have to keep all their weekends open in case basketball has to slide in. So K-State and I are hopefully going to iron this out within the next day or two, but we also have um, home and homes with Kansas. So, so far, uh, we got 19 matches. I think that puts us in the 85 to 90 percentile of matches played this year. I don't know how many teams in America will get more than 20? There are a few because there are a few conferences that are even one of the 14 or 12 team conferences like the MAC that's committing to their entire schedule if they can pull it off. So I think there's some schools out there that will exceed 20 matches, but there won't be many. So, um, you know, I feel pretty good that we were able to do what we've done. And then, you know, for, for those of you that have been with me a while, um, 
regardless of you know what you think about the timing of it all, this year, that year, when they'll play us, when they won't play us, uh, it's kind of nice that I have Kansas and Kansas State four times in a year when I haven't got them, but four times in 20 years. So, um, you know, that's kind of neat. Ho hopefully we can get that thing rolling. Hopefully they'll find some comfort in playing the in-state little guy, which has always been a college problem. But I feel – I hope I was thorough with that. I know the K-State thing is still up in the air, but I feel pretty good about it. I'm sure you guys will have some questions for me about the conference. Is that within the ground rules of this, this call? Sure. I just yeah. decided that, so go ahead. Yeah. Who's got questions about the conference schedule? Maybe hit some of the high, just kind of the highlights. Okay. Of well, everything will be a double there. header. So we're only going to play the West. So that's Tulsa twice, SMU twice, Houston twice, Memphis twice, and Tulane twice, uh, which means two road trips and three home games or three home weekends. We were fortunate to get the three. So you'll have Memphis at home twice, SMU at home twice, and Houston uh, here twice. And those will be Thursday, Friday, or Friday, Saturday matches. Lambo is, I mean, there aren't many benefits of any kind out of everything that's transpired the last few months, but is maybe the one that because of the need to play people close to you that you were able to get people like KU and K-State that haven't been very interested in playing the regular season to finally come to the table. Yeah, I mean, I told Becky Endicott, my boss, if you hadn't heard, she's retired now. But, you know, I, I said, you know, to, to, one of the things about being in Wichita is if, if, if this trend continues, and I know it's, I know it's being talked about, where they're going to, because all the athletic departments are hurting financially, where non-conference travel can take a hit here for a while. I don't think we're through this yet. Well, for better or worse, we're not surrounded by very many programs that aren't good. Um, we've got a lot of good programs in our backyard, uh, and I know that we're pretty good to have for, on their schedule. So I, I do think, depending on your perspective, from my perspective, I, I know when I played, I like the shiny teams in the Southern Ed, and I think my athletes want that too. So um, – I'm excited about it, but yeah, that is absolutely a benefit of this. They, Kansas State and Oklahoma and KU just don't have options. We would have had Nebraska. If Nebraska wanted to play, but but the Big Ten didn't want to let their programs out of prison. They don't have any non-cons. So, um, you know, if you're if you're with me, that part of it's great. And moving forward, after all of this settles back into hopefully a, a normal schedule and, and a normal routine next year, are you hoping that that maybe some of those schools, Missouri State back on the schedule and so forth, kind of see the wisdom of maybe we wouldn't have gone this way previously, but it makes a lot of sense financially and a lot of other ways to, to keep playing these people? Yeah, you, if, if you can, if, if all you can do is add and you care to add and you you wonder how many schools do I fly over to get to play Temple? You know, it, it really seems silly. Now, I don't think it's that silly when you're talking about football and television and men's basketball and television. But for everybody else, I mean, a few years ago, for a brief period of time, San Diego State was actually going to be, I forget what conference it is, but it was East. And they were going to be flying golfers across the country to play golf. And, you know, it just seems odd that we have to stick to a conference model that's been around forever, which was in place just to assure that we'd have people to play. But now it just seems ridiculous um, to spend that kind of money on non-conference travel. And heck, even maybe you might even say conference travel. You, you, why, why, why does Wichita State basketball and Wichita State volleyball have to be in the same conference? It, it might not seem that crazy at Wichita State, but there are plenty of other schools where the commitment 
the one sport versus another are night and day different. And some, some programs are just a fish out of water in these conferences and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, the, the pragmatic thinker in me thinks that presidents and ADs and conference commissioners uh, are gonna remember this and try to maybe think of ways to make this happen where maybe even non-football and men's basketball conferences are formed more regionally. I know they're thinking about it. It just makes too much sense. One other thing on the schedule, it just occurred to me that, all right, if, if West is playing West and East is playing East, one of the reasons the season was moved to this time of year was because the NCAA decided last fall to move the championships to the spring. So what happens at the end of conference play in terms of who advances to the NCAA and so forth? Well, so, so far, all the conferences that have chosen to stick with it uh, will send an AQ, an automatic qualifier, their, their champion, either by conference play or by conference tournament, they will go. Uh, and I think they're going to select 16 at large teams, which we all know will be, you know, pick your Pac-12 and your you know, Big Ten and then maybe throw in Baylor and there you go. So um, it's pretty much going to be that for the at-larges this particular year. And everybody just needs to get over it. That's what's going to happen. Well, in the American, will there be a tournament of some sort or will the Western champion play the Eastern champion in some sort of playoff? So our, our, our conference tournament was supposed to be the top two teams from each half plus the next two best teams through a tie-breaking procedure. Like last year, four teams from the West represented uh, were in the conference tournament to join two teams from the East. This year, on a cost-cutting measure, it's just going to be two from the East and two from the West. That's it. Four teams, winner goes to the, conference, the NCAA tournament. All right. We have some questions for players and coaches, but uh, particularly for the players. And the first group comes from some of our younger fans. We call it the Kids' Corner. And so we're going to uh, ask some of those questions. And the first is from Cash J. His question is for Lauren McMahon. And Lauren, he wants to know, why do the girls near the net give hand signals behind their backs? So the girls near the net are obviously the blockers. So. The blockers are giving hand motions behind their back to tell the defense what blocking play we're running. For example, like this is read blocking and this is front blocking, fronting blocking. You want to expand on read and front just to, for those uninitiated? So front block, front like fronting the hitter would be like uh, as a middle, I would be fronting the middle hitter. So wherever she's her and reading would just be staying still until the ball is set and then I make my move. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Jordan W. It's for Sophia. And Sophia, Jordan wants to know, what's an average weekday look like for you? Maybe not so much now, but during a, a typical season pre-COVID. Right, so we're talking um, like any like typical Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where we're not traveling and we're at home. Uh, we would start the morning with like an individual where we're in some small groups and we spend about 40 minutes working on small things. And then I would go to class. And then after class, if I didn't, if it wasn't already lunch, I would study for a little bit. I'd go to lunch, go to practice, uh, which would be a three hour practice from one to four. I would actually have another class afterwards. Sometimes I would eat dinner and then study a little bit and go to bed. Maybe the obvious question is, this is not a typical year. So how much has that changed with the COVID protocols? Um, it's changed quite a bit because now classes are all online. Um, we, I had to change my schedule around really weirdly this year. So a lot of my classes were in the evening because everything was so in, up in the air. I was trying to avoid conflicting with practices so much. Uh, we've, had good, we've had more time to study, which is good. Uh, but yeah. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Our next question is from Caroline M. It is for Michaela Wench. And Michaela, Caroline wants to know what's your favorite thing 
about being a college athlete at the Division I level? Um, I would say one of my favorite things is being able to be surrounded by such high caliber athletes that all of like the same goal as me and we all work so hard every single day. And then um, also the responsibilities that you're like can learn um, things like time management and discipline that help you like later in life. Um, like with Sophia was saying, you have to like really get your schedule, be on top of your schedule and stuff, but definitely the people you meet, um, being surrounded by such great people um, is pretty awesome. All right, thank you. And this is a kind of a perfect follow-up question to that. Sarah T would like to ask Sina, how do you go about finding that balance between the responsibilities that come with being a college athlete? Well, just as stated before, it's a lot of time management, but I think one thing that I have kind of discovered over time as it is my second year in college is time management is a big thing, but also self-discipline. So right now I'm in a pre-session for uh, school and with double days also going, I have to like discipline myself to like in between really sit down with my laptop, um, take out all the distractions, try not to watch Netflix in between, but really just sit down, do my homework, get it over with so that later on I can focus on other things that I need to do. And you've kind of answered this with what you just said, but it seems like uh, with so many online classes that that raises it to a whole new level of developing self-discipline because you have more freedom there in front of your laptop. Yes, for sure. It's a, it's a really tempting for me sometimes to just like, oh, I'll take a little mental break, but then it's like 9.30 at night and I'm like, let's get this over with so I can get rest for practice in the morning. All right, thank you, Sina. Thanks to all of our young fans who submitted some great questions. And uh, we have some others from some of our uh, little bit older fans. But uh, before we move to those, uh, Lambo just wondered if you had any follow up on some of the things that were discussed and uh, what you've been dealing with as a, a coaching staff in trying to make sure that your student athletes are handling these new types of challenges and, and things that are very unfamiliar to someone that's been in the profession as long as you have. Well, I, I, my, my magic word in our first meeting back in the fall when we knew things were changing was it just seemed like we needed to be nimble and flexible, um, that we weren't going to be uber concerned about plans and schedules, and we we're going to try to find some comfort in day-to-day. -day. Um, we have some NCAA rules that prevent us from scheduling a practice when one wasn't scheduled uh, within 48 hours, but we certainly can cancel or move a practice a little bit. Um, we haven't had too many times, Mike, when we've had to do that. I think Gretchen's been great with us, our, our academic advisor, in getting the academic stuff squared away so the girls don't have that to worry about. Uh, hey, I want to give a big shout out to some parents uh, of a, the local volleyball community, a younger sports team that has really donated, made their own lunch, lunches and, and breakfasts for us uh, because you know the dorms weren't open. Um, we, were, we don't have it in our budget at this time of year to buy meals. We were gonna have to shave off somewhere else uh, in our budget like matches because we, we don't even buy equipment anymore. So it was the only place to save money would be, you know, with travel to matches. So um, heck, we've even had uh, families deliver breakfast in the morning and lunches um, here uh, for us. And we've been eating in the new championships club. Is it still called the championships club? I think it is. Uh, that's where we've been eating. Uh, the girls have been great with that. And I, I think I haven't, heard a peep out of them. Um, that's obviously very, very different. Uh, strength and conditioning has been pretty normal. Facilities are available to us and Hannah's been great uh, and us adapting that. We've made some changes to that routine. Uh, and then honestly, we haven't had much gym conflict. The, the two basketball programs and volleyball, uh, as far as I can tell, have worked very well together because you know this, we've never had this where volleyball was also trying to squeeze in 
some double days. So you've got a men's team going, a women's team going, some visiting teams showing up to practice and play, and a volleyball team trying to have some practices twice a day. It was we really don't have anywhere on a normal year where it looks anything like that until camps roll around. And that's a completely different deal. So hats off to all the assistant coaches that organized that and the head coaches for being uh, very accommodating. It's been, it's been going really, really well. So much, much smoother than I think a lot of people may have thought. What have practices looked like in terms of adjustments you've had to make for the COVID protocols? Do your players wear their masks all the time that they're on the court? Uh, do you, do you, test in any way, take temperatures or whatever every day when people come in? What what are the procedures that you have to follow? Um, do you want me just to be a robot and spit out the, uh, <laughs> the company? No, I, I would, you never, I would I... never ask you to be robotic. <laughs> well, um, hey, somebody's going to have to explain to me why volleyball is any more high risk than, than men's or women's basketball. Um, you know, we're not leaning on each other. I played basketball. You all played basketball. I mean, we barely even touch each other. Uh, we wear masks. I never see the men's team or the women's team or anybody else. Even when I go out to the sports forum and watch kids play basketball and kids play volleyball. Um, and my friends around the country, volleyball players are wearing masks and basketball players are not wearing masks. And somebody needs to explain to me uh, where the rub is there, uh, I have a feeling we are just a more compliant bunch that we are doing what we've been asked to do by doctors and trainers, not providing much resistance. But your volleyball team has the best record on campus from these tests. Um, we've had we've had, I think, four positives, but three were before we started in the fall and one happened over the break or maybe it's maybe it's five. I think we've had five. Um, you know, and hey, we're probably going to get one or two or 10. I don't know. But up to this point, uh, these young women on my volleyball team have done what they've been told to do. And our staff has done what we've been told to do. And we've got the numbers to show that we've uh, handled it as well as anybody around here. Hey, we're going to play Missouri State next week. Every one of those players, they have 18. They all test tested positive in the fall. Their whole team. Now, the good news for them is now they don't have to worry about losing anybody. And we're certainly vulnerable to losing people now because we haven't had it. I guess that's the bad news of doing everything correctly or better. But um, I don't even know if this was your question, Mike, but I, I'm, I'm proud of my team because not everybody's running around here behaving this way. And I don't even know if I'm supposed to say it out loud, but I'm saying it. We've done our job and we've done a good job. And now we're going to get on buses and we're going to sit next to each other. And if someone tests positive, it is what it is. And it's going to take some people out and we're just going to have to swallow it and deal with it. But nobody's done this any better than we have. For someone who's as organized as you perpetually are, has the toughest aspect of all of this been the uncertainty and the sort of fly by the seat of your pants every day, things changing? I know in the fall for uh, you knew pretty early on the conference wasn't going to play a fall schedule, but I know at one point there were some possibilities that maybe you would play some non-con in the fall. And if the girls that played were potential red shirts, would there be a rule that you could play them and still red shirt them? So I know that there had to be a lot of going back and forth on a lot of things, including practicing and, and what are we preparing for and when are we preparing for it? This volleyball season will not count on paper for any of the athletes who play. It will be a redshirt year, even if you had already redshirted or you perhaps will redshirt down the road. This, this year is a free year in terms of uh, athletic eligibility. Emma Wright would have, the ability, would have the right to come back next year if she wanted to. Uh, she is most likely going to be going to grad school at the University of Arizona. And it's something she's always had scheduled to do, um, has my blessing, and she will move on. Michaela Wench could come back next year and do the same. She and I have talked about it. She has her, her sights set on other things, and she will move on. And that will happen all over the country. 
Um, there will be others that will stick around and play. And then the following year, you'll be looking at the junior class and you, you'll be wondering what they want to do. And then you'll be looking at the sophomore class and you'll be asking them what they want to do. But there is an opportunity for anybody who would like to keep their athletic eligibility going and they've been maintaining academic progress. You've got girls at Wichita State, the younger classes, the freshmen, the sophomores who have already redshirted, or the juniors that have already redshirted, that if they played their cards right or want to play their cards right, they could they could play for a fifth year uh, and walk out of here with a graduate degree or close to it. And, you know, I I, I promise you this, Michaela, uh, Michaela Routsep would have done that. And 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 because uh, she got so much school done so soon um, and that, that will be available to these athletes. And so it's really going to affect recruiting because, you know, you know, you typically know when someone's going to graduate because they hit that in line and the finish line rather, and they're, and they're gone. But, you know, I, I, I will respect the wishes of these girls as they move forward. And we'll certainly talk about it from fall to spring and fall to spring, um, you know, and we'll deal with it as we go. But that is something that's very, very different. Hey, there's a track athlete at Wichita State. I don't know who it is. Coach Rainbow was telling me about this guy. But they're asking him to come back for a sixth year, and he already lost one year, and they're potentially going to be losing another year. But uh, I don't know who this athlete is. Gail, do you know who it is? I don't know who the athlete is, but there, there's somebody that might be here for, for six competitive seasons. I, I, maybe there was an injury along the way that caused him to have the fifth one available, but that's something that's going to be out there in the NCAA. And I think we have a track athlete right now that is looking at that. So yeah, that that's very, very different what we're dealing with. You know, if things, as we all hope, return to normal, you're going to play a spring schedule and then turn around and have next year's season back to normal in the fall. Is there anything difficult about that or will it be to some degree kind of like you playing your exhibition matches that you get to in the spring typically every year and then transition from that into the fall schedule well i have exactly zero non-conference matches scheduled you you know that we are owed some returns penn state owes us a return colorado state still from a million years ago <laughs> owes us a return um cal poly owes us a return Creighton owes me a return. Wyoming owes me a return, even though we haven't gone there yet. We were supposed to go there this year. That was all part of a three-way deal. And we're certainly going to try to get those conversations going. But like I said at the beginning of this call, don't be surprised if non-conference travel in August and September is cut down to hop in a van, hop on a bus. And we nobody I know has heard anything about that yet. So the coaches are laying low because there's just nothing we can sink our teeth into, nothing at all. Now, you did have some practices in the fall, and now you've resumed this spring, getting ready for the upcoming season. From what you've seen, including the, the couple of public fall scrimmages that you had, what maybe excites you about this upcoming team? Well, first and foremost is I would say since 2003, to a tiny blip on the radar in 2009 when we had a couple girls in our program go through some personal problems, we had great competitive culture. And then from that blip in 2009 through 2017, we had elite competitive culture. And I will not run and hide from this. 2018 was a struggle, very difficult season. 2019, where I handed the most competitive schedule ever it just happened to be the timing of it all. So winning was going to be difficult. We actually were climbing out of that. And um, it's, it's worth as much to me, Mike, as anything. Uh, these, these girls have given me my program back and I owe them the world for that. They have been so much fun. The freshmen and sophomores are just a group of, fun, excitable energy. They can't wait to practice. I think they've given life to some of the older girls that had to 
go through that rough patch because I think it left a mark. Um, and I think that they have, can I say, resurrected some of that stuff. Um, and I, I just, I will always answer your question with some of that because that stuff matters. And we, we have fun at practice again. We can't wait to play. We all like each other. At least I think they like me. And we, um, we enjoy volleyball again. It's not a chore anymore. It's fun like it was supposed to be. So I have to get that out. That's, that's been the, my favorite thing. Now where I come from, where I come from is training. These volleyball players are just getting better. They just are. We're, we're better at volleyball things than we were. The, during the fall when we had so many unknowns, practices were great. We've got a lot of people in the gym so we can be competitive. I, I have friends that have, you know, 12, 13 people and then five of them are out for COVID and they're trying to practice with four or three. I got some friends. Hey, at Arizona, it was coaches with one player at a time for a month. One, one player, uh, four coaches, 400 volleyballs, one player, one after the other. And that was in the Pac-12. Um, so, you know, we were we were fortunate that our conference said, let's go for this. And we have. Um, we've been physical. We've been competitive. We've tried a lot. Uh, it's just been really, really, really fun. Uh, I honestly don't have any idea what people on the other side of the net are going to look like, but I know the people on our side of the net are better than we were. And my, one of my mentors when I first started was a guy named John Dunning at UOP later at Stanford. Um, I had a sports psychology class where we were talking about goals and I called him and I said, so what kind of goals do they have at UOP? For volleyball and he says well we just got one get better every day that's it that's the only one we have in our program but it's not easy to do and we do we talk about goals we do little things like that kids like that but i'll tell you what get better every day sticks with me these girls are pretty much doing that I, maybe it's not daily because we've had a few we've had a few days that didn't look like yesterday or the day before that's going to happen but week to week we're improving mike we have some questions that were pre-submitted by some of our fans. And uh, to kind of follow up on what you were just talking about, Dina, R, her, the way she phrased it is, what are some of this year's biggest strengths and weaknesses? I might amend that to, to what do you think are probably at least strengths and what are you maybe most anxious to see how well it's developed when you play somebody else? Well, when volleyball in the United States decided to go to, you know, 12 substitutions and up to 15, it, it makes the 6-2 a relevant discussion. There's reasons to do it. There's reasons not to do it. And you really need to find out where your team is. But one of the things that screams 6-2 is firepower. And I believe we have firepower on the pins. Uh, you know, here we are trying to identify maybe who the top four are. And we're frequently talking about six, depending on how you want to play and who plays next to who. So for starters, that part of it uh, is hard to get away from. Now, there's ways the 5-1 can beat the 6-2 if it has its strengths in other areas. And one of them can be ball control and defense as you can put more passing and defensive specialist type people out on the floor. And that would be interesting. But I think it's easier to go from 6-2 to 5 than 5-6 to six because the 6-2 the part does require that the six rotation girls can really do that job. Um, as long as you're keeping the well-oiled enough to play like an M1 or a middle in a 5-1, I feel like you can make that switch easier from six to five. Maybe some coaches would think, think the other way, but I, I, think the, I think the DSs as they come in, um, in the 5-1, I think their job is business as usual either way. So. We've spent most of our time in that six, and we are going to uh, see how that goes. Um, was that the question? Kind of, yeah. And yeah, you I started going. Certainly, if you feel like you have that kind of firepower, that well, that's a strength, right? Strength. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you have to. I mean, I, I, we, we got some, we got some firepower, and I, and our setters can can deliver the long balls, and we can reach them, and our middles are trying to be busier and busier. So I think that's good. Hey, the, the serve and pass game, we're just, we're just a year older at that. We ought to be a little bit better uh, there than we were. And um, while this isn't easy for everybody to hear, 
Uh, I was pretty critical each of the last two seasons about wing defense and overall play at the setter and libero position uh, relative to our opponents. Um, there's plenty of ways to measure and compare teams. Uh, that's one. Hitters always seem to take take all the heat when we don't hit well. Well, I have no problem uh, putting weight on everybody's shoulders. And, you know, Chelsea and I have spent a lot of time um, with, with defense. We did a lot of individual defense a while back. We're more into team defense now. We've, we've organized an old defense, but a good defense, which is what out West we called the high corner. And we're much more organized in that infield outfield role cross court are digging down the line, which has to be part of that defense is Sean says it every day. I just can't believe how much better we are digging down the line and digging cross court on the wings. So um, yeah, I, I, don't know yet relative to the conference if that's a strength, but I will tell you it's much stronger than it was a year ago, and that's going to help us a long way. Defense travels well, as they say, Mike. So if we can keep that defense up, uh, good for the Shockers. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Scott T. Briley, it's for you, so prepare yourself as I ask it here. Scott wants to know, is there any one set? play particular rotation that when it comes around gives you maybe a little extra bounce in your step gets you a little bit more excited about anticipating what might happen in that rotation um i'm gonna have to go with a play i think uh whether it's me or my teammates getting a stuff block it hypes almost everyone up it's a big momentum changer um i also want to go with a person i think morgan weber uh, hypes everyone up. I think that especially I can speak for myself. Um, I'm a different player when I play with her and I'm screaming and high five and more. So yeah, I'd have to say that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Lambo, this is for you from a Jeff L and you've kind of addressed this, but how will travel and away games be a little more complicated under the current situation? Well, if you're going to play Wichita state, you got to test three times a week. Uh, Oral Roberts sent some concerns through an email today, and I'm certainly glad they did because it, it starts seven days out, and guess what today is? So they had an opportunity today to get it right, but our conference, nobody, we can't play anybody that doesn't do at least what we do with protocol, and we've chosen to pretty much do the max. Um, if you guys haven't figured it out, our conference thinks they're the SEC, so they do everything they can to act and behave like their older brother out there. And uh, whatever they do, we, we, we claim we need to do. So we're doing that. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, you know, travel is going to be different. We, we can't eat on the bus, so we're going to be having to pull over and eat. I just found that out a couple of days ago. That's going to that's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, getting in and out of facilities, how many people can be in and out of facilities. Um, I'm, I'm nervous that they may tell us we need to take two buses uh, instead of one because uh, that expense will go up and I'm already on fumes. I was on fumes before this started. So um, I've heard talk about that from other coaches around the country. I hope they don't catch wind of that out here, but that one does scare me a little bit. Um, you know, and then, you know, what happens at each facility? It seems like everywhere you go, they have a different protocol or different rule and reg. So um, I'm not sure how difficult getting in and out of gymnasiums are or the restaurants where we try to eat as we go from state to state and city to city. But that's something that we're sort of uh, managing week to week. Our trainer keeps an eye on that with all the different all right, thank you. This question really is for any of the players and I'd like for as many of you to chime in as are comfortable. Uh, Eliana C asks, are there any particular pregame rituals that you have? Ladies? Um, as a team, after we do our like initial warm up before the game, we all go back into like the hallway and we do our like, we ready cheer, I guess. I won't do it for you guys, but um, that gets us all really hyped up because it's super fun and we're yelling and screaming and dancing all together. And um, it's just a lot of fun. But uh, other than that, I think a lot of girls just like doing, um, like listening to music and whatever they want to do by themselves. 
Matt just asked online for all of you to do the cheer, Casey. <laughs> Is that possible? Um, I won't do it alone, but I got you. I got you. Let's do it. <laughs> we we want <laughs> <laughs> Starts like that. Goes something like that. <laughs> like, better with people. Oh, we ready? What? What? We ready? Hey, we ready for you? Not bad, Matt. So it's good effort, ladies. Appreciated that. Uh, any, anything else about pregame rituals? I have a question. What's the thing? Where did the thing with the ribbons, the hair ribbons start? Does anybody know? I mean, everybody has particular hair ribbons before matches. And sometimes some of you have the same and you tie each other's ribbons. Does anybody have any idea where that even started and what it's all about? I have an educated guess. Uh, it, it, I don't know that this is true, but if I this could go back to Andy Hardig because oh yeah and Andy Andy always always had something you know some surprise in her hair and she was that bubbly kid on the team and I it won't surprise me but Shannon might know the answer to it, this it, it, it's the Andy Hardig group it's the 2004 group uh, the one that we won our first conference championship with we went to the NCAA together for the first time and it was that group Mike you know the one that said we had to you know the bus rule yeah. <laughs> that was quite a group <laughs> if you, <laughs> yeah. you got money on that. You know, little toots there on the bus yeah that group they they're okay. the ones that started it any other rituals ladies um, I, I, I gotta think Morgan Weber's got a sport ritual. It's gotta be. Honestly, not really. I would just say most of the time I just listen to music that's gonna pump me up and get us going. Maybe maybe some screaming, some hype me up stuff, but that's about it. <laughs> all right, and we have some freshmen on the call and Lori P would like to know from any and all of you, What's the experience been like navigating the already tough challenge of adjusting to being a Division One athlete and all the demands of college life and playing a sport? It's definitely a change from high school as far as school goes and practices and training. But I think Lambo did a great job of recruiting such amazing older girls because they're always there to help us and make sure that we're in check and have the right color shirt on, be where we need to be. So we just have super great upperclassmen and even just the sophomores are super great about just talking to all of us. And even during practice when we might not know what's going on, nobody's ever shied away from just telling us what to do and helping us out in those situations. Why don't you guys tell them how you spent your first two weeks at Shocker Volleyball? Um, I guess I can because it was – um, so we got there on like a Sunday and we tested, everyone got tested and everything. And that Monday we were supposed to start practice. And I wake up at 6.30 a.m. to my roommate on the phone with our trainer telling her that she had tested positive. So the night before all the freshmen, we all ate together. So we had to all quarantine. So our first two weeks as freshmen, you're we just sitting here in our dorm for two weeks but the team would come up and say hi to us during practice and stuff and would bring us treats and stuff so it's an experience I will never forget that's for sure. You know an, er an earlier comment sparked a question for me and this would actually be for any of the upperclassmen beyond the freshman level the comment about the great group of older girls and helping you with the adjustment and so forth I'm guessing unfortunately that some of you may have been in situations where that wasn't always the case and as maybe that inspired you to try to be more that way and to be leaders for this freshman group um I know I personally uh I was at a different school but when I was a freshman I didn't really have upperclassmen that were very good like team oriented or like friendly and so I know when I was a senior and an upperclassman I wanted to be able to 
be that for the freshmen and made sure that they had someone to help them like with anything they needed. Um, so I know that like impacted me and how I wanted to be an upperclassman. All um, right. I'll chime in too on this one. I think last year when I came in as a freshman in the summer, um, we had open gyms because uh, pre-COVID so we could get into the gym whenever we wanted. And the older, the upperclassmen actually like, instead of just doing like straight out scrimmages, they would have us do certain drills. They'd be like, oh, do this because in practice we're gonna do this. And so it's just gonna be so much easier to translate it over. And then when practice time came, we actually did end up doing those drills that they told us to do in the summer. And so it was just like easy for us to transition. And then because those, uh, the freshmen this year couldn't get that opportunity with us, get those open gyms in. I think when we just like got put right into practice, it was kind of like anything you guys need help with, like let us know because like I was just in that position and like being, having those people to help you is just so much easier to get through practice and like not be so nervous already being like the new person there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your comments this evening. Uh, that concludes our fan questions, and we're going to take a moment to announce the winner of the grand prize Shocker Volleyball Swag Pack. The winner will be walking away with team apparel, which includes t-shirts varying sizes for the entire family and friends, a jacket, and a hoodie. There's also a team signed volleyball and some other accessories as well. And the winner is Vic Hecker. Congratulations, Vic, on winning the prizes. Our Shocker marketing, marketing staff's represented on the call tonight by Connor Phelps, and he will reach out to you via email to, uh, that you use to register for the call tonight to coordinate the logistics of getting you your prizes. So for all of you who have joined us online via Zoom, thank you so much for being on the call tonight. I'll open the floor one last time to any of, uh, to Lambeau and any of the players on the call would like to offer any final remarks. I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming out tonight and joining us on Zoom. Um, we really do appreciate all the support that you give us. Um, we can't wait to play next week, which is after not playing for over a year. So we can't wait to get back on the court and hope you guys can watch us in Coke Arena or on ESPN Plus. Lambeau, final word. I'm excited about the team. Um, you know, I think I think one of the requirements of my profession is to be an excuse maker. I hear coaches complain and make excuses about everything. Honestly, um, I've been here 20 years, 21 now. Um, this, this wasn't the worst year to have something like this happen. Um, uh, we we really weren't in a position that we wanted to recruit anyways. We we just love the young classes that we have and didn't feel like we ought to bring somebody in right behind them if they would never play behind them. You just don't want to like put somebody back there for three years to wait. So we were going to just really be patient from a recruiting standpoint anyways. So that was taken away from college coaches, but it, I didn't know how busy we would be at it. And another thing was this just gave us time in the fall to, you know, get some of these young players caught up and to try some new things. So I, you know, I just don't want everybody to think that, you know, it was all bad. I mean, I really, really enjoyed uh, having all the training time. I mean, for my world, sometimes I think the matches get in the way with what I'm trying to do because I just like training all the time. So it was a lot of fun for me to be able just to know that we were going to just have nothing but practice for a while and just kind of experiment with some stuff and see what happens. So it was, it sounds, it, it sounds weird to hear Casey say we haven't played in over a year because for me, it's kind of gone fast, at least since this fall. Um, I, I've kind of enjoyed it. I, I hope we don't do this again, but uh, <laughs> it was fun. And I, I had a great time with the team and I really want to give all the administrators in my, in my athletic department, um, you know, big, thanks and and just they, how have being able to adapt and figure things out in fact I, I think I think for all I can tell the, the, the shocker head coaches um, have been very easy to work with 
and I, I, cause I can only imagine it could have been really, really ugly and really bad, but it went really well around here. All right, Lambo, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being in attendance on this special event. We look uh, forward to your continued support of Shocker Volleyball, and the season starts soon. Season tickets are on sale. Uh, you can get yours at goshockers.com slash tickets or by calling the ticket office at 316-978-FANS. And again, the season opens next week. The Shockers will play three matches in Springfield, and then the home schedule opens in two weeks with North Texas in town for a couple of matches. So thanks again for joining us, and the long-awaited Shocker volleyball season is finally just around the corner. Good night. Hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs>